All right, my friends, welcome to the RPG Backlog. This is Prof Plays Games, and over there is my friend Travis, and we are here for our final Final Fantasy XII podcast. This is episode 8 of our Final Fantasy XII podcast. We're going to dig into the end of the game. We ended last time with the uh, Three Ascents in Pharos, the lighthouse, and now we are moving towards Bahamut. I have the story summary pulled up in front of me, but I'm wondering if you want to take it from memory. <laughs> Do you remember the story of this part? Because it's been a couple of weeks for us. Let's see. So after the end of Pharos, Ash ended up breaking the sun, sun crest, but Bahamut had already been powered up from it from Sid's ploy. No, wait. Mm-hmm. Ash didn't do it. Um, uh, what's his name? The Pirate, not the other, not both here, but the Red House. Red House. Yep. Uh, and then we went back, and then let's see, Ash's uncle, the one that was in charge of the city, whose name escapes me right now, the Mar- Marquis Marquis Bondore. basically went into battle with Vane's army, not realizing that Bahamut was there. Uh, uh, to start blowing crap up because Bahamut's a beast of a spaceship, which was really or I'm calling it a spaceship airship I guess is probably the better thing to do it yeah, yeah. really weird for me because when they said Bahamut I immediately went dragon because that's what Bahamut has always been in every other Final Fantasy you're thinking game. of the summon right yeah. yeah yeah and there are summons in the game so I was like well why wouldn't he just have <laughs> this badass dragon summon no it's a giant airship okay that's cool uh, and then, and so we decided to go attack it internally trying to dis- disable it and we go essentially it's you walk in you land after some cinematic garbage where people are dodging bullets and shit's blowing it's up very star warsy in this section yeah i was like okay star wars yeah i was star wars would be the one it's like star trek but i never really, really watched that and there's not a lot of fighting spaceship wise as i recall i don't know yeah uh, right. yeah it felt very reminiscent of the millennium falcon charging at the death star mm-hmm uh, and then you get on there and you literally just run straight to Vayne, but you fight uh, the Judge Cabranth as a boss again. Yep. More dialogue between uh, Bosch and, well, what's his, his really, he actually gives his actual name now, but it's not Cabranth. Yeah, I forget what it was, though. And then you go fight Vayne three times over. <laughs> uh, and then... You have a really awkward celebration while there's still a giant war going on. And you literally just murdered everyone in Lars's life. So and he, he's over there mourning the losses of people. And you guys are like, yeah, we did it. <laughs> uh, which I thought was really freaking weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. His dad's dead. His brother's dead. Yeah. You literally um, just murdered his brother in front of him. Yep. And then Gabranth, who had been protecting him, basically was on his deathbed as well, who you just murdered. Well, then he's telling Bosch to pretend to be him, right? And he becomes Bosch's or well, Larsa's bodyguard. Did he tell him to pretend to be him? I read, as I recall, he just told him to protect Larsa. Oh, I always assumed. Um, no, I assume he assumed his, his uh, identity. Well, no, no, I, the way he looks afterwards when you see him in, like, the credit scenes where everything's been calmed down, where, and the fighting has stopped and everyone's gone on, and, like, Ash is the the queen, and mm-hmm. um, Balthier and Fran, who, quote-unquote, sacrificed themselves to keep Bahamut from crashing into Rabanasta. You like, oh, they did all this stuff, and it looks like they died. And then you find out like a year later when they're going over, it's like, oh, they're like the spaceship, the spaceship, the airship that Balthier had left to Vaughn and Pinello disappeared. And there was like a note from saying, hey, basically implying that Balthier and Fran were still alive. Yeah. Um, but, anyways, when they're doing that cutscene, I, 
I assumed he had assumed the role of the, his brother's judge position because he had cut his hair and was like everything he looked had basically done his hygiene, I guess I'll put it, to make himself look more like Gabronth did. Yep. So I don't know if it was Gabronth saying, hey, impersonate me so much as it was, hey, protect Larsa. And it was probably just easier for them to make him take up the mantle of Gabronth since they were twins. And, and it just would have been easier for him to just slide in because it'd probably be yeah, a little bit so. yeah. weird that Bosch, who had been fighting against the empires now all of a sudden protecting i had the same thought like wait a second are you aren't you isn't this the head of the empire now <laughs> like um yeah. you know this uh fandom uh summary here says uh he's taken up you know the the lord losses Lars's bodyguard as should the last of house Solidar fall arcades would be consumed by civil war like wait now you're defending the empire i'm confused yeah but I, I yeah I don't know it was kind of interesting but yeah so that was I, I guess it's kind of a really shitty rendition of what I remember. That was that was nice though. A couple of things I'll probably add to it is at the very very end, Vaughn and Pinello are going to go find. I assume they're going to find Baltier. Um, Pinello comes to them saying every good sky pirate needs a partner, so they're going to like do their thing, which is the beginning of the next Final Fantasy twelve Revenant Wings, which was on DS. Uh, Balthier leaves behind the the ring from Ash that Ash gave him as payment back at the tomb of Wraithwall. So that comes back here at the end. Um, but the thing that I found the most striking in terms of the story was just how Ash was removed and had to be, you know, she was a queen, so no one could see her and she was kind of doing her own thing. And I felt sad in that moment where, like, she's with you this whole time. And all of a sudden, like, these people who have grown with her through this journey now don't get to see her and she's not a part of their lives so much anymore, except for as like, you know, regent or whatever. But I also wonder, and this is not a good thing. What was the timeline from start to finish on the story in reality? <sighs> you don't mean the end of this. You mean the whole game? Like it's not to that. Cause that one, that, that was a year later. Was that a year last later. Right. Yeah, exactly. I'm talking about from when you pick up as Vaughn and doing your, stuff to the point where you storm uh, Bahamut and end the war right I like that wonder well feels like it was really quick yeah so would she have really had that strong of a connection to them overall a but b also the thing is I think it was kind of poignant in the fact is, is like she's now the queen of a you know, an entire country and it kind of makes sense that she no longer has time to do those things oh it, it totally makes sense but it just made me feel sad because you know you've grown with her and she's grown with you or whatever else um so just from a story standpoint i was like oh, that kind of sucks it'd be it would be interesting to know how long of a timeline they say that this is supposed to have taken place through. yeah i'm cruising through wikipedia right now and it's talking about how caught between two empires dalmasca and a number of small nations have already been subjugated by arcadia two years before the game begins which doesn't answer our question Two years, so the beginning part happens um, where the brother dies, and then two years later, Vaughn kind of enters the picture. So from the very the epilogue, two years later, we get Vaughn, and then I don't see any other mention of time. Time, yeah, that yeah. sucks. Um, the Revenant Wings takes place a year after the events of Final Fantasy XII, which is basically when the epilogue ends. That's when it starts. Um, yeah, damn. I don't know. What what would you guess? I don't know. It felt like a month or two at most. Yeah, it seemed pretty. There was no long waiting periods, right? You were just go, right. go, go. So, it, yeah, yeah it, almost like it wasn't concerned with how many, yeah. how long it took, to be honest. Uh, it, I mean, to me, it, I was thinking like a month. But then, you, but then the other thing is there's no real... Well, I guess there is kind of a, an idea of distance based upon the giant world map, but at the same time, you have no idea how long it takes to go from point A to point B, and you do yeah. a lot of it walking. <laughs> right. But, yep. So and the, the two times speed makes it feel like it's quicker, I guess. So maybe because it's all walking in the distances so much that they, maybe it was a year or two. I don't know. It didn't feel that long. I don't know if yeah, it, it, it didn't, but yeah, 
you know, given the fact that you're doing a lot of walking over large distances, I would imagine that in theory it should be you take a long time to do that type of stuff, right? I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, like if I extrapolate it to like the real world, how long would it take for that to happen? It would take months and months and months. Yeah. Right. And I don't know if that was the intention or if the intention was just, nope, it was it was a couple months, nothing else. Get over yeah. it. I don't know. So these last boss fights between, like, basically all three, um, start with Gabron, then you go to Vayne, Vayne, Novus, and then the Undying Vayne turns into this fucking, you know, it's like three boss phases. Um, how did how did those fights go for you? What what did you think about them? Um, I, I'll continue my thought process with judges and that they're not bosses. <laughs> But yes, I know they have red bars, but my God, it's still, they're, they're just scripted, man. Like, that's what it is. It's just kind of filler, it feels like. Mm-hmm. And it's not bad. It adds to the story, but it just it wasn't a challenge. No, it wasn't. It didn't feel like a challenge. I didn't die. I I beat them all three in a row, and it kind of just happened. Yep. Um, and, you know, again, I will give the caveat that maybe powered up the LP cheat um, to have everything. But I didn't have any super weapons or anything like that. Um, I just had a lot of health and a lot of ways to regenerate my health. There weren't a lot of um, status effects that were bothering me so much here, which was kind of nice, actually. Um, yeah, but then I, I go back to what Anthony said when I made the comment about using the LP cheat, and he was like, oh, that'll be fine for the mid game, but the end game, it won't do you any good. But yeah, I'm, and I took that to mean like the optional late game hunts, not necessarily the story. That, that's what I was going to ask. Is that is yeah. that what he was implying? Because because uh, uh, I took it the same way when you when you first said it as you did, which is like, oh, the end game of the story. story. But yeah. as we went through it, I was like, this is not this is not challenging in that regard. What level were you? Forty. I finished the game at forty seven slash forty eight for all my characters. Okay. I finished the game at 40 slash 39. Wow. Jesus. Okay. So it must have been harder for you in but terms it of. Wasn't. But it wasn't. But it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't. Right. Yeah. So that's why I, I, when you said that you think that Anthony was referring to the hunts and not so much to the story, I now I believe you. But at the time, I thought that that just meant the game in general. When we got to the end game, no matter what it was, story driven, that it would be wouldn't be as impactful but yeah there is a um in the the game facts guide here the very last um iteration of vein the undying basically uh it says that he has an attack that it's telling you to keep bubble up because he has an attack that can do six thousand damage to your party and i was like i don't think that ever happened because my no one in my party had that much health except for uh, one person did have a bubble belt which brought them above six thousand but I don't know if you had that experience where you're getting yeah. wiped. No, yeah. okay. no one, no one wiped. Only one person had the bubble belt because I didn't know to get it. And I didn't even know what bubble did, to be blatantly honest. Until, but you found the bubble, bubble I, belt. I guess I did. Like I had one of one of my characters had it equipped, and I just was like, okay. Well, but you know what it does. Well, now I, now you... I did afterwards. Oh, okay. I found out yeah. that it doubled your health, and it, yeah, I saw exactly. that after I did it. But none of my characters were over it, and I, and no one. No one got that low either at any given point in time. Mine didn't, for sure, uh, which I, w- I thought was interesting. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. So, Cabronth, story beat, not that big of a deal. Vane, that one actually pissed me off, and not because it was challenging, but because it had gates in it. Is A, gates, and B, yeah. mm-hmm. when you're going to put a status effect on me, and then you're going to end a phase, it's kind of a dick move to leave that status effect there. Because what happened to me when it went from phase two to the final phase for Vayne, he had immobilized Vaughn, and then the cutscene triggers. I'm like, you son of a bitch. But what ended up happening is that third phase, Vayne is on the outside of the arena. Right. So he moved from being right next to Vaughn to being way the fuck away and just starts blasting him right out the door. 
And I'm sitting there going, I have to now, even though I was mid using the item to remove the immobilize, that got negated. And now I'm back at ground zero and have to redo, reselect it to redo it. But the other thing that pissed me off is it also didn't do it to just Vaughn. It also, for whatever reason, Bosch was also immobilized and he didn't have any status effects on him before that fucking cutscene. I'm like, wait, what the hell's going on, man? Oh, wow. So did you get hit with it during the cutscene? I, I don't know. Yeah. But, so it's just, like, it's annoying when you, if they're right next to the character, to the enemy, and then the phase transitions and they're still right next to them, I don't really care. But when you adjust not only, because the other thing is you moved arenas from phase two to phase three, because that's when he ran outside. And I think that's just kind of a messed up thing. If you're going to move the arenas, if you're going to move the change the layout, then you need to remove at least status effects that force you not that don't allow you to move as well. It's kind of mm -hmm. you know cheating in a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, I I don't know if I found that to be as annoying, um, but I definitely I can understand why that would be annoying. I think it'd be super annoying more if like that caused you to like not be able to succeed in that and having to restart um that would be really frustrating i just found it I, I, it wasn't like it it didn't bother me so much i was like ah this stupid game is just like another one of those little things where it's like dude seriously Can't, why yeah. This game, like, you know, I think, over, you know, we can maybe pivot into, like, how we felt overall. In some way, it's, like, death by a thousand cuts. Like, there was nothing that stood out as, like, too um, frustrating for me. But um, overall, there were just a number of choices and the way that the game presented itself that was, like, not not bad. But I felt like I held it back from being better. Um, and that's kind of where I land at the end, where, like, there were some good story beats, and I did feel some emotion about the characters at the end, especially Ash, and thinking about um, Baltier and Fran being gone, and Pinello and Vaughn um, going after them, and uh, that was all cool. Uh, I thought Bosch moving in to the be, be the bodyguard was, like, the weakest part of the end story for me, because it didn't make sense for the reason you mentioned, that kind of, like, stepping in to defend the Empire a little bit uh, there. But, yeah, overall, um, I I was thinking about it because we both finished, I think, probably about a week and a half or two weeks ago, and we both moved on to other games. And, you know, coming back tonight to record, I was thinking, okay, you know, what stood out to me from this game? And, you know, obviously the mechanics of the Gambit system stand out as a thing that happened. But in terms of, like, things that stand out as, like, a lasting, like, cool memory from this game, it's sort of the story and not a lot else. So 100% agree. Right, like I, I finished last Friday, uh, and then I after I finished it, I finished it Friday night. I believe we did our recordings, and I was like, okay, I'm done. I walked away from it, and then Sunday I came back and sat down and was like, okay, I'm gonna write my notes on this now to see what what comes out of it. Mm -hmm. The first thing I did when I sat down to write notes on it was, oh. I need to delete this crap off of Steam. <laughs> Literally. Like, I went onto my computer, deleted it off my computer, opened up the Steam Deck, deleted it off the Steam Deck, and then I was like, yeah, I'm just going to hide this game. I don't need to see it ever again. And then I started to write my notes, and then I walked away, and then I came back Monday, and oddly, I had an urge to reinstall it and try the hunts, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You you did some optional hunts along the way, though, right? Or no? Uh, at the very beginning, because when mm -hmm. we first started, before we even left Rabanasta legit the first time, I somehow got ahead of you during the time period, so to kill time before I went into the next section that we were supposed to go to as a group, I did the, all the hunts that were available to me, which was only like three or four. And I didn't find anything about them. I think that's when I realized I was like, oh, shit, I'm supposed to use the the license point board because I wasn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's why these are really hard. And then I did it. And yeah, I I don't know. I, I did a couple inadvertently just by accident stumbling into them. But I didn't go seek them out. I 
along the way, you know, obviously I did the ones at the beginning like we all did, and then I did a couple in the middle, and I purposely sought out a couple toward the end, and mainly because of Anthony's recommendation that sometimes that was the funnest part of the game in terms of, like, different mechanics. So, you know, there's a lot of things to juggle. Um, I found, uh, I think I talked about uh, Gill Snapper, perhaps was the name of it, where it was so, it was so much fun to get to the boss, and then the boss was kind of like, over the hunt and it was like oh the battle was fine but the way to get there was pretty creative so i can see the inclination to want to reinstall to do that because you know in my view other than the story in terms of the mechanics and the the gameplay it was probably some of the funnest parts of the game for me to be honest yeah, to me this this is one of the few games that i've ever done where i'm sitting there going if you had just put up an hour long video on the story, I probably would have been just as happy with that. Yeah, I agree. I mainly because that's the strongest part of this, the game for me. Um, and it would have been a lot less time for sure. I enjoyed, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad, you know, I, I think it's stupid to say it like this, but like, I feel like I've gained some gamer cred for finishing this <laughs> pretty obtuse jrpg that is even for final fantasy fans kind of like that one final fantasy you know i don't think anyone except for anthony maybe would point to it as their favorite um for the most part i think people either it's not super polarizing but it's like it was a thing that happened and people played it and i don't know have thoughts about it but i don't i don't feel like it's people love it or hate it they're just kind of like mm, and then move on um, but it does make me think, I'm just thinking about this, the cadence of single player, um, Final Fantasy since 10. So we've got 12, obviously, and then we've got 15 and now 16. And I feel like the reception of all three of those have been fairly mixed. Um, I don't know what you think about that. Uh, wasn't there, well, I mean, they also went back and I feel like during this time period, they did like 10 to... And what was wasn't there Final Fantasy thirteen was the um No thirteen yeah, did I not say thirteen? Sorry. Um, yeah, there, after, it was twelve. Twelve, thirteen, 15, fifteen, sixteen. Yeah, I forgot about thirteen. And did, when did they do ten two? Well, let me find out. Um I have them all pulled up here. I know. Oh that no, that 13... was way earlier. Never mind, sorry, that was two thousand three shit. Okay, never mind. Ten two was two thousand three? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh Jesus. Because like three or thirteen was two thousand ten. Um, ten two was two thousand three. That's that cannot be fucking right. Uh, <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Does that does that make you feel? It does. Ten two yeah. is two thousand and three. Jesus fucking Christ. Right. I th I think of that as an old uh, a younger game than that. Um, For some reason, I had in my head that it was newer than twelve. I I don't know why, but I had in my head that this that 12 was an older game than 10 too interesting i guess that wouldn't make sense because i don't think f they've done that right where they've put out a sequel to a game later than a, you know numbered earlier well, they hadn't really done a sequel a direct sequel until that point 10 2 i think was the first real I direct the first sequel that oh, i know at least that i know of mm -hmm. there's probably someone out there is like no you idiot <laughs> there was well, other ones there is it's uh final fantasy 4 had a sequel called uh have it in front of me too i'm scrolling to it right now final See? fantasy 4 came out in 1991 and yeah. then final fantasy fuck me that's that's I not the title was no, 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 no 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 final fantasy 4 the after years came out in 2009 so it's a sequel to final fantasy 4 that came out like a decade and a half later wait wait, wait. you said it came out in 2009 yeah, Final Fantasy IV, The yeah. After Years, came out in Right, so Final Fantasy X-2 still came out six years prior to that, so it was still the first direct sequel. Oh, fuck. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> oh, that is true, I guess. Um, at least, that, like I said, at least to my knowledge. I, I yeah, could yeah, be wrong. Yeah, you but know, anyways, I think you're right. Yep. Um, where the fuck were we going with this? <laughs> I we we were just we we got into we got fucking sidetracked because uh, Ten Two came out in two thousand three and that blew us away. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh oh, you talked about street cred and um. Oh yeah. Uh huh. This we're not being this a type of game. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I I'm glad I did this not because. Uh, 
let me be frank. I did not enjoy the gameplay in this game at all. I could see where someone who would want to go tinker with perfect optimization could get enjoyment out of this to some degree. If your enjoyment is not about you controlling it so much as it's you... It kind of reminds me of like uh, what Madden games are nowadays. It's less about what you do and more how you tweak the characters in the roster, right? And it, it kind of feels the same way with this. Is it's not so much about how you directly control them, but how you tweak their jobs and their abilities and, and their coding, essentially, on what to do in certain situations that optimize and make the most out of this game. Yes, that is true. And that's just not me. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think I walk away from this game feeling like it wasn't as engaging um, because of that's the gambit system um, and the way to kind of brute force that where you are not using the gambit system is super inefficient. Um, so I can see why it would like it's a nice attempt to try to like automize or automate, excuse me, some of the boring stuff of a MMO, which this is not, but a, an RPG, you know, an MMO in single player fashion here. Uh, but ultimately it is, I think I've said it quite a few times, but there's, uh, there's more in the game and a lot of the more stuff is, uh, in that, uh, critical path. And it's just, it's not, I'm going to say bloat, um, but it's uh, it could have been refined quite a bit and brought in the optional hunts to be like a mainline. But some of the creativity from the, the hunts into the mainline um, stuff that you're doing, the boss battles or whatever, getting to the boss battles, I think it could have made things a lot more engaging. I just don't know how you get around the gambit system. You either like it or you don't, and it gets in the way of liking it. Yeah. <laughs> This was my biggest pet peeve at the time. I loved, and I still do love, the turn-based situation. I never needed this real-time live-action party control garbage, mm -hmm. which is dominating the, the JRPG slash RPG realm in recent years. But for me, you take me back to the old school Final Fantasy 7s, 8s, 9, even 10 for that matter. Uh, I loved those turn-based situations. Um, and this just take took all that away from me. And it, even though you still have a party member, three-party group, even though in theory you can control them, even if you put it on normal timing, there's just too much going on for you to, in real time, control them and do it. So you have to rely on the Gambit system. And to me, that just, yeah, I tell them what to do in a way. But at the same time, it just takes away my enjoyment because I've lost, I feel like I've lost control. Yeah, and that's like the remove from this game is that uh, I feel a, a bit of a remove in terms of the moment to moment gameplay. Like there's that distance there. And then because there's so much, so much between the story beats that I just feel removed there too. Um, you know, very early on through, I think probably four fifths of the game, it was sort of like, okay, I'm ready to get to the next spot. I'm ready to do the next thing and get through wherever I'm at here. Only in the, at, after Arcades, honestly, is when the game really moment to moment gameplay for me, and I know I'm not for you so much, um, was much more engaging and much more interesting. Um, and I just kept wondering, is that a relic of its time? Like it's 2006, I believe was when it first came out. And like, it, I feel like it would feel really immersive then. I wasn't really playing these types of games then. So I don't know if I know how you've explained that even then you're like the gambit system looks like it sucks, but uh, removing that, like the, the game world, was it like the lore, the every was it more engaging than it came across to us now? Because we've had so many games in the interim that have been done much better, in my view. I I wonder about that, but then at the same time, old school Final Fantasy Seven, old school Final Fantasy Tactics, those still hit for me to this day. Mm -hmm. Right, and I don't know if that's just. So I've, Xenogears, we've talked about that before. That that game, if when I bust that out, 
I still to this day I love everything about that game except for the last disc. Same thing happens with all of them. No, yeah, they fall apart at the end. We were like, budget's done. We gotta finish. Yeah, it's like, oh, budget. You've depleted your budget. You're out of time. You need to ship (laughs) this shit now. Exactly. (laughs) We don't care if that's gonna hinder the product in the long run, and which is sad. Nowadays, I think studios are a little more likely to to push it to a certain degree, depending on the studio. Let's be fair. so I don't know if it's be the, because it's a relic of a time or it's just because it's just not our thing. Yeah, and that may be it. And I, I think part of me, and maybe you felt this to some degree or less than me or the same as me, but I wanted to like it because Anthony's loved it and talked about it so much on the Prof and Dev Play Games podcast. I mean, it comes up a lot on that podcast, and I just I wish I liked it more for that reason. This is part of the reason why I felt bad in some of these times when we talked about it. I'm like, I feel like I'm just shitting on this game, and I feel bad because I know he loves it so much. Mm-hmm. And this just kind of goes back to some of the conversations that we've had in general, um, not just maybe not us, but just in the Discord with other people that have created friction, I guess mm-hmm. I'll put it, mm-hmm. is there's things that we all love. I mean, I've I have been very open about the fact that I love FromSoft games, like Souls games. I love those games. And I get that there's a lot of people out there that can't stand those games. And I totally get it. But I guess it's a little bit different with this one because I know Anthony loves it so much. I was like, I, I, I need to find what's good about this because he and I usually have pre- have had in the past pretty similar tastes. Actually, I think all three of us to some degree have. Yeah. Hmm. So that's why I was like, okay, if he loves it, I've, I've got to be missing something. I've got to be missing something. And I I just haven't found it. And I'm okay if, like, someone likes something – or, sorry, if someone loves something and I don't love it like they love it, but I, I usually like it, you know? Right. And this is certainly – you know, if I were to put a, a number on it, it would be like a 6 out of 10, you know? And that's not, like, awesome. That doesn't feel awesome. It's above average. Yeah, I mean, certainly they're, they're, this is not a bad game. This is simply a game that's not necessarily for me. Um, and I'm, you know, for a moment I was wondering, like, maybe Final Fantasy, more Final Fantasy is not for me than is for me, but that's, that's not really true. I mean, I played and finished 15. I'm going to finish 16. I'm fucking in love with 7. Um, 6 was really good. So it's really seven remake. Let's be fair, though. <laughs> so seven, seven remake. Yes, exactly. Um, seven remake. Yeah. Um, Which plays very differently from what little bit I've played of it than the original seven. Oh, yeah. No, I played the original seven all the way through to Junon City. Um, and then I was like, I don't know what the fuck to do or where to go. Um, so I was done at that point. But I, I, I played a fair a bit of it to even have enjoyed that quite a bit. I think the story was very interesting, even though I think the writing was translated poorly. Oh, um, yeah. Very poorly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, seven, 7 is fucking great. I finished the Eufy DLC for Intergrade last night. And last night? Night before. One of the two. Before. Yeah. Um, and just fucking loved it. Um, although it was more like a, you know, it was very battle intensive and not so much story uh, intensive, but it still had some great battles. So. Yeah. I, I mean, for me, I put this... This is not even an average game for me. But I agree that I I don't think that's any... That's not representative of what the game is, right? I see that there... I can see where people would love this game, and I can see where people would hate this game. And then I see where people are going to be like me, where they're just like, it's a game. Sure. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, it has some good points. It has some bad points. But it just doesn't click with me, and that's that's fine. Yep. Yeah, I, I love that take where it's you know, when you play a game that is simply not for you. It doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean the people who like it are, you know, b- dumb or whatever in some way. No way. I mean, Anthony, from a game design perspective, Anthony is so <laughs> smart and just like there's so much here that is interesting in that regard. I can see like there's so much depth to it. I can see why it's interesting from that perspective. I just don't need to look at art in that way and don't really come to it for that you know 
I come to get immersed for the most part, and this is this did not do it for me, unfortunately. And then the gameplay didn't um, light light by light a fire underneath me. So, yeah, I go back to what we said before. The first part took too long and too, drip fed the story too little to probably grab us. And by yes, the time the story exactly. did pick up, it's like uh, for me at least, I was sitting there thinking, I just need to power through this. So yeah. I think that is the from that's my take on it, right? Is it took too long to get to the story and to get to the point where it would have grabbed me and by the time it did, all the other things that I found frustrating about the game had already tainted my view to a point where there was no saving my outlook on it. Yeah, that's an interesting way to put it because uh, when you have uh, like a, a TV series, a movie, a book, a game, whatever, where it starts off in the negative, how do you get back out? You know, if it's, if you can't get back out quickly, it then compounds. It's like exponential. Um, oh, so. crap. What was that book series that you and I both started reading? And there was, there was like a really good book, and then it went hot garbage. You're not thinking about Sword of Truth, are you? <laughs> mm, Terry what? Goodkind? No. Was that Terry Goodkind one? Well, I mean, his that series certainly did that. Whereas, like, um, Wizard's First Rule was the first book, which I th- I thought was pretty good, and then it didn't have that many good books afterwards. <laughs> but you, that's which, which one? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Richard all. Rawl and Kalan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was it. That was it. Yeah, yeah. Wizard's First Rule was amazing. Stone of the Te- uh, Stone of Tears, I think, was hot garbage. Yeah, it wasn't great. And three, I can't remember what three was called, but it Blood wasn't good fold. either. Blood of the Fold was not good. I thought four was okay, the Temple of the Winds. Yep. And then, pff, I can't name another one that was Soul good. Of the, dude, I'm looking at the this, and I'm like, holy crap, the Sword of Truth is 17 bucks long. <laughs> dude, I think it was like seven or eight. That's crazy. Soul holy of the shit. Fire, Faith of the Fallen, Pillars of Creation, which is where I stopped reading. Naked Empire, Chain Fire, Phantom Confessor, the Conf- First Confessor, the uh, uh, Omen Machine, the Third Kingdom, Severed Souls, and Warheart. I did not know there was that many. Holy crap! But yeah, th- that was the thing, right? The, like it, it lost the that series lost both of us at one point because it just got bad. It's the same yeah, and he was a fucking dick too, Terry Goodkind man. Oh, he no, was um, just an asshole. I remember one, it was, fuck, I remember it was 2003, 2002, 2004, when people were really upset about his shit, um, kind of going like the objectivist Ayn Rand route, and he was like, the people who don't like my books are like the terrorists who ran the planes into the Twin Towers. I was like, well, okay, I'm fucking done with you, man. Wow, I did not Very know that. Done. <laughs> it was fucking, uh, uh, it was like, it was like a, you know, like Reddit AMAs, it wasn't Reddit, but it was that same kind yeah, of thing. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like, nah, I'm done with you, man. <laughs> but uh, it's that type of situation with this game, right? Like, it just didn't have enough enough goodwill towards us to keep us locked in and to like it. And by the time it did provide it, we'd already gotten to the point where it's like, okay, man, I'm I'm kind of done with this. Yeah, exactly. Um, I am still happy that I played it. I feel like, um, God, you know, with fucking not nearly 60 hours in that game, you know, I could have played a couple of smaller games really fantastic games and that sucks um but it did give me some distance from final fantasy 7 remake where like i was obsessed and then i got away from it i was like thank god um and then i started rebirth you know after i finished the yuffie dlc i was like oh no here we go <laughs> um but it was a good it was a good uh i don't know spacer between amazing games i just wish it was more amazing so I- i'm glad i played it because you know, as I said before we started this, I pre-ordered this shit. I picked it up, and then I never once put it into my PlayStation, ever. And I kind of regretted it a little bit because, like, you, did I did I not give it a fair shake? And I'm glad I did this because a, it was cool to go back and learn the story and learn another bit about Final Fantasy, which is a series I've loved for years. And b, it was just kind of fun to do this. Uh, on, as I said before, if we weren't doing this, I would have stopped a long time ago, but I still found joy in playing the game because of our discussions about it. Yeah, I really like that, too. And it's kind of cool to have uh, a piece of art where you can, 
you know, dig more out of it than the sum of its parts by having that discussion. And, you know, for me always, I mean, people know for a long time from my other podcast is like, I love doing this to bring, d do something with friends, right? Like we wouldn't have played a game together if this didn't exist. And it was, it was really fun to do that. And that's going to be my endearing memory of this. So I will always look back fondly on the game, even though I would never play it again. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I hit it, Steve. You can't, I have to go to the hidden games to see it at this point. That's funny. I mean, I uninstalled it as soon as I was done. I was like, oh, I can get a couple more trophies. I'm like, why? Nope. I, I value my time in my life more than that. Um, and there's other things to play, other RPGs and other games to play. And I Sometimes this is like a, I look at this as a palate cleanser. It makes me enjoy the other games that uh, are That's the word I was looking for. Yes, exactly. It was a palate cleanser between seven uh, and moving on to something else. Um, I mean, it, just it kept me from playing Stellar Blade longer than I would have liked, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I saw your uh, hour count on Stellar Blade last night. You're at like 19 or 20 hours, so you're doing okay. <laughs> well, there's a couple hours of dead time in there. but Idle time or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But still, I... Probably like eight of that was Wednesday night because I was up to like 1 a.m. playing the game. Uh, but anyways, I love chasing that high, man, where you like you find a game like that where you're like, I don't want to put this down. Like it was, you know, again, seven remake for me where I just kept playing and playing and playing. Um, so it's great when that happens. Yeah. All right. Anything else for the good of this podcast? I mean, this game is an interesting one. For those who like history in Final Fantasy or love Final Fantasy, it's worth checking out. I will say that. The story is good. Give it a little bit of time. If you can stomach the Gambit system, you'll you'll be fine. I agree. I, it's worth checking out. There's it's there's some several curiosities there and some fun story to be had. Um, cool. Man, we already ruined it all if you've listened to this, but... <laughs> You know, you might be like me, though, where, like, you like to have the story, so it hangs the schema of what you're playing on. I, I don't know. Story spoilers don't bother me very much at all. But I'm in the minority, I think, there. Yeah, I'm um, in the same way, so. Yeah, like, just, to, I, I don't care. Tell me. I, You know, first of all, it helps me understand the story better, but also I will fucking forget everything you told me. So it doesn't Fair. quite, it doesn't matter. Uh all right, my friends. Well, thanks for tuning in to this sequence from the RPG Backlog. If you like our show, please rate us on your podcast service of choice. Coming up next week, we are going to start digging into Undertale. My friend Scott is coming on. We're going to do a general uh, introduction to Scott and just RPGs in general. And then we're going to dig into Undertale, which we've recorded a couple podcasts already. The game is not as long as I thought it was. <laughs> so it might be, it will be a shorter sequence than this one, <laughs> but that's okay. It's still fun. All right, folks. Thanks so much for tuning in and uh, we'll talk to you next week.